Welcome to the MIT Alumni Japanese Whiskey Tasting hosted by the MIT Club of Boston. My name is Kevin McCumber. I'm an MIT alum and I run food and beverage events for the Club of Boston. A lot of you have been at a lot of our events, so thank you for returning to those of you who have been here before and welcome to those of you for whom this is the first time. So um, tonight's agenda is pretty straightforward. I'm just gonna do this brief introduction and then I'll turn it over to our presenter for the evening. He'll be taking us through a history of Japanese whiskey, and Japanese whiskey 101 and doing a tasting and Q and A session as well. And then as we normally do, we'll conclude with the breakouts where we get into small rooms of five or six people uh, and just chat with each other like we would if we were in an in-person tasting. Um, this is first it? Is followed by the after party, which is uh, where we go off the recording um, and we'll hang out with our presenter for a little bit after the event. We can talk about anything whiskey, whiskey wise or otherwise uh, with him in that after party. This event is being recorded and will be available as all of our events are on the MIT Club of Boston's YouTube channel afterwards. And I'll be sending out that link in an email after the event, probably early next week. And I ask you if you haven't done so already to please continue to support MIT's COVID-19 funds. Uh, I was telling our presenter before we got on, we, we raised over $5,000 with this event for MIT's COVID-19 response, which supports students and folks in the MIT community, as well as research efforts into uh, battling the many effects of COVID-19. Honestly, I've been hoping we wouldn't have to keep doing this uh, late into 2021, uh, you know, looking at other things we could support, but uh, COVID-19 is still a thing. So then we're still doing it. And I appreciate everybody who has contributed generously to those funds. If uh, you have a question this evening, it's pretty easy to ask a question. Just go to the reactions tab in Zoom and uh, select raise hand. And we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. And of course, if you have uh, questions that linger, you can reach out to me and I'll be happy to connect you to get your questions answered. As many of you know, this event is one in an ongoing series of uh, fine spirits and food tastings. And we have a number of events upcoming. The next one will be on November 3rd. It's a wine masterclass with Bledsoe Wine Estates. You might recognize that name if you're uh, from the Northeast or have followed the Patriots. That is a winery founded by Drew Bledsoe, the uh, Patriots quarterback before Tom Brady. And um, he retired from the NFL in 2007 and started uh, growing wines in his hometown of Walla Walla, Washington. So he's been doing that for, I think about as long as he was playing football. You know, he's not one of these people that slaps a celebrity name on a thing and, and just markets it based on his name. He actually is very involved in the process and they've won a number of, number of awards, including Wine Spectator's Top 100 Wines. Uh, so really excited to have Drew Bledsoe lead that tasting for us in a few weeks. Then in January, we've got a meat and honey tasting. And in May, we have the MIT tasting. So putting aside the alcohol and going with uh, just a straight tea tasting there in May to welcome the spring. If you'd like to get notice about future events, I ask you to join uh, our, our private food and beverage email list. I'll send the link to that afterwards. I'll also send the link to the MIT Alumni Fine Spirit Society group on Facebook, where I also publicize our events and we have a little bit of uh, jovial banter in between events as well. Okay. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Eric Swanson from High Road Spirits. Uh, Eric is a co-founder of High Road Spirits, which is the importation company that brought us all the Japanese whiskeys this evening. I really wanna thank Eric, uh, his partner Eli, who I worked with a lot as well, and the entire team at High Road for putting these kits together. Uh, it was tough enough distributing the kits. I can't imagine what it was like putting all these together. Uh, so I know you put a lot of work into these, a, a lot of sweat equity. So really appreciate it, Eric. Thank you so much to you and your team, and um, the floor is yours. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, hi, uh, I'm Eric Swanson, and um, you know, as Kevin said, uh, one of the founders of High Road Spirits. Um, we started with um, importing alcohol, I think, in 2012, um, under the moniker of Tokiwa Imports, which I think will be the background of um, the slides to come. And uh, today, High Road Spirits is an umbrella of international spirits from around the world. 
uh, kind of inspired by our partners' love of travel and uh, love of food and beverage around the world. Um, I myself have uh, lived and worked in Japan for the last 25 years um, with a focus on Japanese beverage. So outside of Japanese whiskey, be it sake, be it shochu, be it Japanese beer, any questions that you might have after this, um, I have way too much information stored up um, between these years on, on the subject matter. Um, so before we start tonight, uh, and I can talk ad nauseum about myself, but the one thing I like talking more about myself is Japanese whiskey. And we have a sample of six whiskeys in front of us. And there's going to be kind of a drinking order. We're kind of going to drink as we roll through history um, of, of Japan. And, and basically, um, we can approach the, the initial drink in two ways. Uh, right here, I have some soda water. And we're going to start out with the Akashi Blended Whiskey. Now, Akashi Blended, if anyone can see my screen, uh, can people see my screen? Well, anyway, uh, is one of our flagship uh, whiskeys within the mix. And basically, I'd like you to do is either uh, pour it neat, pour it on the rocks, or pour it in with some soda water and make yourself a Japanese highball to sip along the way as we kind of go through this little history lesson of Japanese whiskey. Screen says Tokiwa, that's right. Tokiwa is the, um, Tokiwa, my wife, who's one of the founders and partners in this company and is in Tokyo at this moment. And I just sit here awaiting my visa um, before I actually move over there probably in the next month given the current COVID pr protocol that's in place. Um, so anyway, however you'd like to approach it, Akashi basically is a blend of Japanese single malt, um, lightly peated. Akashi is situated in Kobe. Um, so those are familiar with the geography of Japan. We've got Kobe Bay, Akashi is just to the south of Kobe on the other side of the bay. And Akashi translates, it's named after the city um, that means the bright city. The owners of Akashi have been making alcohol in their location for some 300 plus years. And their ancestors, some 500 plus years, helped settle the area that, in which the distillery is located today. Uh, outside of that background, we'll get a little bit more into it as we proceed throughout this lesson. I wanna talk a little bit how the whiskey tastes. So because today, we have, I think, something like 30 different whiskey distilleries across Japan. We only have about 10 or so that actually have mature whiskey that is three years or older that's available for the market. Um, but this distillery happens to be the closest uh, in Japan to the ocean. So we get a little bit of that brininess. You get a little bit of that salty sea air. The aging houses, um, are often open and exposed to that sea air. Blending in with that sing single malt, we have a weeded whiskey that tends to be a little bit lighter, a little bit drier. And so what we have is really approachable whiskey um, at 40% at alcohol. Um, sh should I not? Oh, you should absolutely drink these. Please, by all means, be consuming these as we go along. All I was saying is we're going to go about it in order, the first one being that of the Akashi blending. I myself, and by the way, kampai to you all. So a lovely cheers to start the evening. I myself am going to lead with a highball. And all a highball is, um, is, is named uh, basically after the glass. And it's soda water and whiskey. And if you want to add a little bit of lemon or a little bit of mint, it is the most popular way of consuming whiskey in Japan today. So as we line up the whiskeys, now that we've poured our Akashi, we're gonna go with the EY45, the I-W-A-I, pronounced EY, 45 blended whiskey, followed by the Akashi single malt, followed by the Sanuki peated, then Ichiro's malt and grain, and finishing off with Ichiro's malt and grain limited edition. And I'll cue you along the way, 
on when we will taste these different distilleries. So I see a bunch of chatting. Let's see, did I miss anything? So yes, all right. Shall we begin to the first page? Eric, yeah. I, I can help with, I can help manage the chat if you want. No, so we're good. I, Kevin's okay. got it. We're good. Oh, Thank good. you so okay. much. Appreciate it. Um, so anyway, if we go to the next scene. Um, so a century of Japanese whiskey. Very often the question, which is next? So as we'll go through the, um, the order one more time, okay? It'll be EY45, followed by Akashi Single Malt, followed by Sanuki Peated, Ichiro's Malt and Grain, and then Ichiro's Malt and Grain Limited Edition. No problem, my pleasure. So we've got a century of Japanese whiskey in front of us, and in front of us are some of the key characters uh, that we'll speak of that go a long way for the century. And the interesting thing of a century of whiskey is if we think of a history of, of spirits, right? And we think that a century is really a short time. And why is it that we only have this hundred years of Japanese whiskey? Can you go to the next slide, please? So, um, and, and really the origin story starts in 1854. And prior to this origin story, Basically, the Japanese in their first interaction uh, with uh, Europeans uh, didn't go over so well. Um, they didn't think they bathed enough, and they certainly weren't really keen on the religion that they were trying to impose upon the island. And so for basically 250 years, Japan closed themselves off to the rest of the world with a couple of little hubs of trade and commerce, but really... Any, uh, any of the outside world was pretty much uh, kept at bay from them. Well, in 1854, we have an ambitious Commodore by the name of Perry, and he comes over with his steamships. And in his steamship, he has a couple of things that basically will change and bring us all here together today. Change the world, change Japan. And one of them, of course, is the Japanese first taste of whiskey. And then the, um, and the other is basically, are you, are you able to, um, the other is that of um, um, the technology and the roadmap from the industrial revolution. The next page, please. So prior to this, ooh, one back, it's all good. There we are. So, um, uh, really, the the basically the the whole intent was really not that of imperial conquest, but one more so of actual uh, more trade, commerce, and an invitation, a forced invitation, for the Japanese to enjoy to join the world in that of the industrial revolution, and with that also was uh, a ration of whiskey for the crew. Um, certainly a ration of whiskey for Perry, who died three years later of cirrhosis of the liver. And um, in addition to that, uh, a, a, a lovely forced introduction for Japan to the rest of the world. Next slide, please. So, from 1854... All good, man. I, I've got Kevin driving here today off of a PDF deck. So there you go. It's EY45, Akashi Single Malt, Sunuki Peated, Ichiro's Malt and Grain. And um, Ichiro's Malt and Grain Limited Edition will be the final. Perfect. Um, so basically, we have this narrow little span of time from that of 1854 until 1918. And 1918 really is kind of the debut of Japanese whiskey. And Japanese whiskey um, keeps it, what is the ratio of H2O to whiskey for a highball? And really, um, I would say it's a matter of preference and taste. I generally go about a, a seven to one ratio. Um, you could go a five to one, but I, I would start, um, what I added, I think, was a 10-ounce um, Perrier. I, I added half the bottle of my 10-ounce Perrier full of ice 
with the full thing that was given to you all. So that's how I build my hot ball, if that helps. Um, so anyway, back to our little story here on the introduction of Japanese whiskey. So there are two things that really kept the Japanese from making whiskey up until 1854. And the one we already talked about, and that is the cultural barrier. Um, and the second is, the, is an environmental one. So if you think about Northern Europe and where whiskey's origins are at, uh, we have a plentiful amount of oak across the continent. And so oak is really the key of building our whiskey. Without those oak barrels sitting around, we're never going to get these lovely brown colors, these lovely vanilla, rich nuanced flavors, the sweetness, the, the complexity that comes through. And in Japan, the, the Japanese definitely had barrels, but they, the barrels that they used were made out of a wood called hinoki, a type of cypress. And cypress, if you think of your hamster cage or cigar box, that's the type of aroma that is imparted into any liquid that might rest in it. And traditional sakes actually had a little hint of spice that was coming off of the, the actual cypress that, that it was uh, brewed in and often brought to mark in it. So the cultural barrier, of course, is, is that of the lack of exposure to, to trade with the rest of the world. And so these two things really keep it at bay. The Japanese have had distillation for some seven or 800 years. And so long about the same time uh, that, that the, um, the Irish, the Scotch are distilling, the, the Japanese are distilling. But the main difference is, is that we don't have the advent really of oak barrels being introduced into the mix. So the Japanese are forced to open in 1854 and within 60 some odd years, Japan goes from this agrarian feudal system into one of the world leaders and powerhouses in the world economy. So much so that they've kept any kind of imperialism at bay and uh, other than Thailand, the only other country in Asia that was never colonized. So much so that their power was, and many of you I'm sure are much better versed in history than myself, but they decide to start colonization themselves across Asia. So you have this powerhouse in a very short amount of time with the introduction of the Industrial Revolution, the exposure, Scotch is whiskey, Scots are people. Thank you. <laughs> um, um, with the, <laughs> uh, um, so uh, the, um, I, I, so the main wood that I, I understood is grown is called Hinoki. I, maybe it's cedar, maybe it's cypress. So, um, Welcome to, the, I knew I was gonna come across this, so not a problem at all, but during at least uh, the centuries that um, trade was happening, the type of burial that was used was uh, Hinoki. So Hinoki, whomever would like to Google that while I'm talking and see its origin would be great. All I know that it may not be indigenous, but it was certainly pervasive and used in barrels at the time. Hence the difference of oak. There's a small bit of oak that's grown in the forests of Japan, um, mostly in the north and deep forests and takes about a century to mature and certainly is uh, more troublesome to Cooper than other woods that are out there. But back to the, the story of um, Japanese whiskey and its origin. So basically we have World War I winding, Hinoki is correct, H-I-N-O-K-I. That's correct. Uh, yep, perfect. So, uh, back to our lovely story, the origin, the romance of this. Um, Japan is on the world stage. We have uh, a new commerce, a new trade that's happening with the West. We certainly have the introduction of Western education, really in its first phase that's happening in Japan, the introduction of universities, <laughs> okay, uh, will do. Um, 
the introduction of universities and, and certainly a Western university system. And amongst those, to, uh, the first to go is that of Masataka Taketsuru. And Taketsuru is a young man who's certainly curious um, and comes from a sake making background. Uh, today, his family brewery in Hiroshima still makes sake. Quite interesting, very uh, deep in tradition, very rich in flavor, certainly have not adopted many modern styles and have had his, his family sake. And it's, 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 it's quite interesting. But the first within his family, we go to, to university. And, and during this time, he becomes really curious while studying sake making, becomes curious about distillation and, and the production of whiskey. And out of all the people and the names that we're going to cover today, Taketsuru really deserves the moniker of the father of Japanese whiskey. So um, the big houses of Japanese whiskey, that of Suntory and that of Nika. So Suntory being number three in the world today uh, as the third largest fine spirits company in the world, and also one of the large top 10 producers of whiskey in the world. And Nika, owned by Asahi, we are all familiar with the beer, is in the top 20 producers of whiskey by volume in the world today as well. So within that, he gives birth to both of those. The next slide, please. So his story is, is, is quite fascinating. After university, he gets hired by uh, the second largest sake producer and alcohol producer within Japan, uh, by the name of Setsushuzo. And Setsushuzo um, has this gentleman by the name of Mr. EY, which is on the name of one of your whiskeys, which we will drink shortly. And Mr. EY went to a uh, university, the same university as Taketsuru some 10 years prior. And the two of them hit it off. EY was Taketsuru's mentor. And what they planned was for Taketsuru to make his way um, over to Scotland get over to Glasgow and study whiskey making. And um, as I mentioned before, you know, World War I's wrapping up. He doesn't really want to go across Asia, across Europe um, and over to Scotland. So instead he goes across the Pacific, travels across the continental United States and then across the Atlantic. A really long journey, a harrowing journey. He arrives there and of course, he's certainly uh, the only Asian guy hanging around in Glasgow at the time, and one of the very few. Um, there's not a very welcome uh, 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 feeling for him within the university. He studies hard, but he's like, the weather sucks, the, the food sucks, the people are not warm at all. Um, I knock on the doors of different distilleries to see if I can, can apprentice and they all reject me. They all think that I'm actually Spanish or from some other land and they don't even recognize me um, for who I am. And so he's about ready to, to hang it up. Um, and then he uh, meets a young woman, I believe uh, through, this, through his roommate and, um, and by the name of Rita. And what I didn't tell you before is the president of Setsushuzo, um, had arranged for Taketsuru to marry his daughter and basically marry into the company that sent him over there. And so Taketsuru and Rita really hit it off. They fell in love and they got married over there. So this definitely um, puts nails in the coffin really of his current employer and that relationship. And, and, but what it does is it, it, it builds a bridge that really brings us all here tasting these whiskeys today. And the reason I say this is that Rita becomes the cultural bridge. And um, Rita is that cultural bridge within the mix because those distilleries that rejected him in the beginning with the help of her become open doors. And, and so he begins to work at different distilleries. And this isn't a guy that's just learning how to work a still. This is a gentleman that is basically learning how to engineer a still, learning how to cooper the barrels, learning how to um, build a malt kiln, build a washback, build the mash ton, uh, plant 
plant the barley. So from, from basically from grain to bottle, in all real terms, he's taking notes. And this note is called the Taketsu Report. And if you could move to the next slide, please. So the Taketsu Report is basically the Bible of Japanese whiskey. And he's sending it back to Mr. Iwai um, during all of this, still trying to keep correspondence uh, going along the way. And, and this note that he's really kept for himself is the foundation of the distilleries that become Suntory, the distillery that becomes Yoichi for Nika, the distillery that becomes um, Mars uh, Shinshu up in Nagano. All of these are built on his notes that he has taken back in Scotland and, and, and sent back to Japan. And who's keeping these notes is that of Mr. Iwai. And Mr. Iwai goes on to become a lauded professor. He goes on to have his own um, technology breakthroughs on the column still, as opposed to the pot still. And so the two of these academics really uh, have a deep um, and long lasting relationship. And it's Iwai that really preserved these notes through history. And so since we're drinking as we go through history, I'd love for you to kind of move into EY45. And this is the namesake and really kind of the silent uh, pioneer in Japanese whiskey up until really the last 10 years in which this namesake came through. And 45 is just uh, in regards to the, the alcohol percentage. And so this is made at the Nagano Distillery um, and called Marshunshu, and they make a single malt called Komagatake. Um, EY has three different SKUs. There's EY, the blue label, EY45, the green label, and EY tradition, um, the white label. And basically what we have here is single malt blended with a corn and rye blend. And all of this is anywhere from three to eight years of age. This was specifically made um, for and blended and requested by myself for the US market. Uh, we tend to like things at a, a slightly higher ABV um, as, as far as the consumers, um, at, at least younger consumers in the market prefer. And so this is, uh, we launched this just a year ago and it has become our, our best selling skew within the entire company. Whiskey Advocate <coughs> named it its top, in its top 20 whiskeys for last year. And so something that we are, are definitely uh, very proud of. And, and so that reminds me of bourbon and that is an excellent um, thing, right? The, the predominant corn that we have in there and aged in, in, in ex-bourbon barrels um, definitely speaks to that bourbon lover. And if you go with the blue label, it certainly speaks to that bourbon lo uh, lover as well. If we switch to the tradition, then we're going back to that Scotch tradition of a blended whiskey. There's a little bit of peat on it. It's more malt forward. And so we go into to something that um, those that have an affinity to Scotch whiskeys might actually uh, prefer. So um, a, a little cheers to EY and the role that he played in, in facilitating bringing um, uh, Scotch whiskey to Japan and, and helping uh, Taketsu. Next slide, please. So we had that first whiskey of Akashi. Are we to add H2O to this? Um, from here on out, um, all of these can be consumed neat. You can add a little drop of water or you can add ice, uh, all of your own preference. For me, it really is a point of preference. Um, I, I, I don't get so uh, uh, focused on, on um, how to taste it. It's more of what you find to be the most enjoyable. We are up to 1919. We've gone from 1854 to 1919. Time is moving fast. Before you know it, we'll be in the 90s, folks. Um, and I spoke a little bit about Akashi and their origin story. And uh, so basically, when my wife and I became curious about Japanese whiskey, 
we had seen probably about 12 years ago that it started to be popular again in Japan on our regular trips back there uh, to visit her family and visit different producers. And so we sought out to find outside of the big players, that of um, Nika and that of Suntory, um, who, who else is still making whiskey? And one of them was Akashi. And today, certainly one of the smaller producers that's out there. We have, a, uh, last year they added their seventh employee. Uh, the owner tried to get his children uh, to join and none of them would, but he was able to recruit one of his nephews to join the company. So he's certainly happy that he's got uh, seven people uh, today. At the time, they were the fifth largest alcohol company in Japan. And they're the first whiskey license in Japan. And by no means do I want to take away from Yamazaki and being really the birthplace of Japanese whiskey. So the truth is that with Akashi being one of the larger players on the scene of its time, all of these new Western licenses were coming um, within the bureaucracy. And so if you're that large and you have the opportunity to participate in, in what these new offerings are, why not diversify? Why not sign up for these different licenses? And so they also have a beer license, a wine license, a liqueur license, um, and a whiskey license. Were they making whiskey at the time? Probably not. They were probably just taking shochu and putting it in barrels, but they really didn't have the know-how. They do have at least, um, they do have at, at least um, that, that history behind them and uh, the foresight to be it. And how, at the time, uh, whiskey licenses, we, I, I think were just but a fee and the intent to one day make it. Today, the protocol is much more structured um, and, and, and certainly depends on, uh, there are 47 prefectures within Japan and there are federal, uh, uh, you know, national oversight on those uh, prefectures, but each one, um, uh, basically you have to apply within it. You have to have the physical structure of the still before you get licensed. So there is intent and then there is, um, and you show the government that you have the intent, you build the distillery. And then once it is built, you finally get the license. So they can actually, it's never happened with the 40 different licenses that are out there, but um, in the 30 that have come on in the last decade, but you can actually build a distillery and they could deny you the license today. Never happened, but it is show intent, build the distillery and then get the license. Um, so it, it's quite a fascinating process and, and can be uh, a bit time consuming. Right now it takes about anywhere from uh, uh, you know, 12 to 18 months to get one. But at the time it was just, um, you're a big producer of alcohol, here you go. So the single malt that we're tasting today, um, certainly uh, uh, again, you get a little bit of that uh, brininess, you get a little bit of that, um, that, that sea air, but not as pronounced, right? Um, it's still relatively young at around five to eight years of age. Um, but I think it has a, a nice soft texture. And um, Kevin, did you send out the, the tasting notes that I I'd, um, sent before? And you can send it out after, that's fine. Yeah, those will be going out afterwards. Okay, so I sent, um, a, a PDF on every single one of these products today, inclusive of tasting notes and um, and and all all that we've kind of talked about here. And I'll also um, speak to to regional retailers as well uh, if you wanna wanna buy these. So thank you so much. Appreciate that. Is the single malt peated? There is a bit of peat. Um, that is definitely in it. So not the entirety of it, but there is some peated malt that is blended um, with non-peated malt within the single malt. So that's an excellent question. And we will be trying a very um, peated uh, uh, whiskey next. 
And so I think it's a good side-by-side -side comparison, but that's an excellent observation. I would say within the mix, this is lightly peated. Um, and so, and, and to speak, some of you may have this question later, so I'll kind of head it off. Uh, where does the peak come from? Where does the malt come from? And 99% of all the grain that is used within Japanese whiskey is imported, inclusive of the malted barley. And so most of that peat that you're, you are smelling is coming from, from Scotland um, and where, where the malt is actually uh, made. And, and so, and, and, and definitely um, an interesting approach to it. Next slide, please. All right. So within that mix, we've got Shinjiro Tori. And Perhaps so can I just ask a question real quick. Yeah. Um, there's a little confusion if we were moving on to the Akashi yet or not. I don't think you had officially queued it. Someone just asked about it. Oh, please. Uh, my apologies. Please taste the Akashi single malt. Happy to ask any questions that you might have. And I, I had heard um, uh, I had heard that uh, it was a red, that it was lightly peated. Um, and I, it definitely is. Some of the malt is peated within the mix. I was talking to the fact that almost all the grain that Japanese whiskey is made from is imported, um, most from North America and that of the EU, a bit from Australia. And, um, and this whiskey itself, um, you know, I think it has a lovely texture to it, um, a, a little bit of kind of nice little pear notes within the mix and that gentle smokiness. Some that have an aversion to, to peat might want to skip the next one. Those that love peat, I, I, I certainly do. Um, I'm excited about the next one in the mix. Any additional questions about Akashi before we move on? Okay, great. So, um, whiskey is born in 1924, 1923 with that of Shinjiro Tori. And so what's exciting about Tori is Tori is a marketing genius. Uh, Tori is working in his uncle's import store in Osaka and he sees that the port wine that is being imported, the Japanese uh, like the sweet taste. They have an affinity to it. And what he figures that'll do is that he'll um, basically make a fake port wine himself. He'll take local crepes and he'll add some sugar, sugar, he'll add some uh, red food dye and he'll make the natural, uh, uh, port, natural sweet port wine um, known as Akadama. And Akadama just translates as um, the, the red ball, also the sun. And so the land of the rising sun alongside of a man named Tori and we get the brand Sun Tori. And he makes his initial fortune off of this brand. Akadama is so popular that up until the 1970s, nearly every household had a bottle in the refrigerator and they were told that um, a glass a day would keep them healthy. Of course, until they find out that that red food dye uh, causes cancer. Um, they have since changed the coloration and it's still a somewhat popular brand, but my wife speaks of how her grandmother would drink a glass of that every day. Um, so here we have this guy with a real acumen towards marketing. Next slide, please. And a new fortune made off of selling Western alcohol. And we have this gentleman by the name of Takitsuru who had, doesn't marry um, uh, into the, the family. And there's a bit of a post-World War I um, economic downslide. And what we have with that is no longer a job for Taketsuru when he returns to Japan with Rita. And Tori knew that Taketsuru had the know-how. And so the two of them met up and Taketsuru is like, absolutely, I want to make whiskey in Japan. And I know just how to do this. And Tori's says, that's excellent. I know just the right place. Next slide, please. And Mr. Tori says, 
there's a new train line between Kyoto and Osaka. And basically in Osaka, on the border of Kyoto, there is this place called Yamazaki and they have beautiful water and the train will run right by this place and we can have a sign that goes up next to it. And um, Takitsuru is, a, yeah, that's a nice location, but I really think, next slide, please. I really think that, that if we were to do this, that we should do it up in Hokkaido. And of course, the guy with all the money wins this entire uh, argument. And whiskey is born, you can go back to the previous slide if you would. Whiskey is born in that of Osaka on the border of Kyoto with Yamazaki in 1924. I think it's actually 1923, my apologies. Um, but they make their whiskey and um, three years later, once it's reached a significant age of maturity, they release it to the public and it is a miserable failure. And I wanna ask you all why you think it might've been a miserable failure. Please chime in, talk, text, but I, I'm curious as what do you think why it might have failed? Oak. Oak is a good one, and you're almost Cl there, but I, what was that? Climate. Climate. Climate is good, but not quite. What it actually is, is um, uh, the same reason that we, one of the same things that we were just dis discussing. Uh, he was using peat in his malt kiln to dry out the barley, the malted barley. And so the combination of oak, this brown spirit with this smoky rich flavor, the, the Japanese thought this tastes like Chinese medicine and, and we really have no curiosity for it. And it was an absolute failure. So with that, um, uh, Takitsuru is asked to, he has a 10 year contract and the remaining four or five years that he's left on his contract, he's asked to go brew beer. And you know, the, the two of them definitely have a falling out. Meanwhile, um, Takitsuru is dreaming of building his own distillery and trying to find finance to do so. Um, and, and basically, has the, the, that dream of still building this distillery up in Hokkaido, where we spoke of the climate is much more to akin of that of, of Scotland than down um, around Osaka and Kyoto. And so what is inconvenient, of course, about Hokkaido some 100 years ago is that of transport. Bringing things down for commerce is certainly not easy, even today, uh, we work with distillers that are up in Hokkaido and, and it can be a challenge to move the products around and certainly for us to pick it up um, uh, for importation. So think a hundred years ago, how problematic that was. But he raises his money, he and Rita head up to, to the north of Japan and they uh, build their distillery. And the distillery really looks if you've ever had uh, the pleasure of getting there, it looks like the Scottish countryside. It's old brick buildings. Um, it, you can see the romance. You can see the, the love and the passion that Takitsuru has when you walk through this distillery. And it's, it's quite odd if it weren't for all the Japanese and, and, and other Asian tourists that were there, you would, you would think that you were in Scotland. So it's, it's, it's a lovely place. And he has, a, a, um, his, his historic home is also right there. Uh, and here, next slide, if you would. One more. So um, Japanese with one more as well. There we go. And I got a little hat, thank you. So, the origin story for the name of Nika is quite fast and we're not drinking just yet. We'll be to the next one in a moment. We're still sipping on the Akashi single malt, if you would, but we'll move into the Sanuki um, in just a moment. So Nika is born um, in the little town of Yoichi in the southern part 
of Japan. And while uh, Taketsu is waiting for his whiskey license to be approved, and, and I do believe that the system is more similar to, to that of today um, than um, uh, of earlier times, uh, a decade or two earlier for that of Akashi, he was making um, Japanese uh, apple juice. There are plenty of apples in the area that are grown. He was using his bottling line to make apple juice. And the reason that I talk about this is he was secretly making apple brandy on the side while he was waiting for uh, his whiskey license. And today they still do make a beautiful uh, brandy up at, at the Yoichi Distillery. But the interesting thing is the birth of the name. Nika is an abbreviation of Nihon, which is Japan, and Kaju um, is the reference to, to the apple juice. So Nika just means Japanese juice or Japanese apple juice, a reference to kind of their origin story. So within our history of the birth of Japanese whiskey, we have that of Taketsuru, who gives birth to both uh, Yamazaki and that of Nika Yoichi, um, the two power players within the mix of Japanese whiskey. And then we have Mr. Iwai, who helped shepherd this along. And we have Rita, who is the cultural bridge within the mix. Next slide, please. Next. All right. So what happens from 1946 until 2000? I can tell you that during World War II, what keeps the whiskey distillers alive are getting fuel and grain rations to actually make uh, whiskey for their soldiers. And in the post-war effort, um, it's providing whiskey for the occupying GIs that are there. So certainly during the war, there was a scarcity of food and fuel across Japan, but both um, Nika and Suntory received uh, rations of both to, to make their whiskey. And certainly after there was some scarcity, but the distillation um, continued on. So war efforts uh, certainly kept them alive during those off times of the year. And we have the birth of a distillery called Hanyu. And the importance of Hanyu is, is our last two whiskeys that we'll taste later on, um, is, is that of Ichiro's malt. It's his grandfather's distillery, and it's an origin story that gives us way to uh, the future of whiskey, actually. Next slide, please. And now we're going to talk about Humbo, the maker of Mars whiskey, maker of Mars EY, the maker of Sanuki the Peated. And in 1949, the Humbo family who owns Mars whiskey hires Mr. EY to start making whiskey for them. And the significance of Sanuki is, is that from 1949 until 1984, they were making whiskey there. Uh, under the uh, tutelage of that of Mystery Y. Um, starting again in, in 2016, I believe, or 2018, 2016, they built a new distillery. They had kept the license the entire time that they were there, and they built their second distillery down at the southernmost point of Japan in Kagoshima. Um, and so I'd like for you all to try Sanuki. Sanuki is just named after the town, as many of these different whiskeys are. And it is a heavily peated uh, single malt whiskey. So the difference between Sanuki and the Nagano distillery that are owned by both, one owned, both owned by Mars. So there's Mars Shinshu, and then there's Sanuki. Um, stylistically, the Nagano uh, stills make a softer, more elegant still. The Southern stills, their shape and size produce a spirit that has a little more body, tends to be a little more rustic. And certainly the Southern um, location that they're at causes a more rapid aging. 
So uh, it seemed to make sense to have the hardiness of the peat within the mix. So please go ahead and try this. Uh, I'd love to know what you think. I happen to, I happen to, to love this whiskey. I think um, it's a new frontier. The distillery itself is only coming up upon six years old, I believe now. And, um, and excited to see some of their first releases coming in. Um, yeah, Lagavulin 8, yeah, absolutely. If we, if we think of um, those, those, you know, Lagavulin, Lafroig, if we think of those peatier um, whiskeys, Scotch whiskeys, um, uh, certainly reminiscent of that and, and not far off. So a much quicker aging. The aging on this is anywhere from like three to five years. Vanilla is a lovely thing, absolutely. I can totally see that within the mix. And uh, I, um, yeah, so I, I, I definitely am excited that they're approaching this style. I think that historically, uh, the Japanese have not fully embraced peat. They've, they've kind of blended around it. But to see something this um, obvious and this intense um, is kind of fun for the whiskey lovers. And I, I like to see that the producers are really geeking out on this approach. Eric, so, can you tell us anything about the peat? Is it native to Japan? Kind of where, in, where they get yeah, it? Yeah, excellent. Um, what kind, so, of, what kind of makes it up? So uh, the, the, as I was saying before, um, any of the malt that we are, are using, and I would say 99% of it, Ichiro uses about 10% of locally cultivated malt, and some of these smaller producers are, are getting to as much as 15%, but 99.9% um, .9 of the overall malt whiskey that is produced within Japan is from imported malt. And so most of that malt is coming um, from Scotland. And so um, depending on where the malter is sourcing their peat, um, it's, it's indigenous to that, that location because the peat um, and those that aren't familiar with, with whiskey making, right, is the fuel that's going to be used to dry out the germinated barley. That's all we're talking about is malt, right? We have this little miracle that happens that we have this stored energy within the seed. As soon as we germinate it, enzymes are released that'll break those starches down into sugar. If we stop this germination process, the enzymes still exist within the mix. And that, um, uh, that sacrification, that transition of starch to sugar still can continue. So if we don't dry it, it will spoil. And so the historic source of of a fuel in those regions would be that of peat. And so wherever we are generally getting our malt from, if it is peated, is going to be from the same or proximal place as that we're sourcing that malt. Does that make sense for everybody? Hopefully. Um, so um, we will see out of Hokkaido um, some uh, peat from there, probably in the next few years. And certainly that was where uh, uh, Taketsuru was sourcing his peat from back in the day for his fuel. So there are some rich peat bogs in the north uh, of Hokkaido there. Next slide, please. All right, so in the 60s and 70s, what we see is basically this economic boom unlike the world has really ever seen and with that, we have this growing demand internally with Japan. So for two reasons, right? You have this huge catapult um, of economic expansion that's occurring within the islands of Japan. But additionally, you have protected market. Uh, throughout this time, there's very high taxes on any imported uh, whiskey is coming into Japan. So if you're making whiskey within Japan, you're pretty much protected. And the big houses of Suntory, the big houses of, of Nika, they want to, to add a second distillery to quench the thirst of the ever wealthier salaryman of Japan. And so what we get are 
um, three new distilleries. One uh, called Miyagikyo in Miyagi, and you can see in that little red shade up in the uh, Tohoku area of Japan. And then we get that of Hakushu, and Hakushu um, is uh, just in Yamanashi, in the beginning of the Japanese Alps, and in a partnership with both Shivas and Seagram's, Kirin uh, opens a distillery uh, on Mount Fuji. And we'll start to see some of those whiskeys get imported into the market uh, next year. Very excited, they make some delicious whiskeys. And so uh, I, I'm sure there'll be a very small offering um, but if you do see them, I would, uh, I don't import them, but I would certainly encourage you to purchase them. They make some beautiful stuff within the market, but all of these guys expand their production to feed a growing mark market. So, um, uh, that's what's happening in the sixties and seventies. Next slide, please. In the eighties, um, so oh, we have going back to our friend, Mr. EY. By this time, I think he's nearly passed. Um, but the distillery that was built, that he built in the 1960s in Yamanashi as his second distillery gets moved to Nagano where EY is made and, um, and, and the current production for Mars has historically been at least uh, since 1984. Next slide, please. In 1980, we see the largest selling, single selling skew of any whiskey in the world to this day. And so uh, a blended whiskey, we can't count. If we count Indian whiskeys that are basically a tiny bit of malt blended with um, cane distillate and food coloring, then there are Indian whiskeys that would surpass this. But if we, if all derivatives of grain, this would be the highest single selling skew uh, ever. Suntory Old, I believe in 1986, sold 12,000,000 liter cases of a single skew. So what you have is a thriving economy with a protected market and a huge consumer base. Next, please. And what happens in the 80, of course, with more wealth is a premiumization of the entire set that we have, a focus now on single malts, a focus more on aged products. All of this um, drives the market into a higher degree. Next slide. Again, 1984, we, we put in the current pot stills that have been moved from the previous distillery into their current distillery in Nagano. Next, please. And then we have um, the Ichiro's grandfather putting in his current pot stills and really focusing on malt production. So all three of these different producers in the 1980s have moved from making cheaper blends into premiumizing uh, to making a more premium product within the mix. Next. And in 1982, we have our first single malt released uh, as a major commercial product, that of Yoichi, 84, Yamazaki's released, and 89, Hibiki's released. Next slide. In the 90s, the bubble bursts. And those of you that, are, that, that recall Basically, the Japanese economy in the 90s goes into stagnation. Now, what happens here is in addition to the stagnation of the Japanese economy, you have a negotiation um, in the late 80s with Thatcher and the Japanese. And Thatcher's, Thatcher's like, I got all this whiskey that you guys need to buy. And the Japanese are like, we have all these lovely cars that you need to buy and all this lovely technology. Perhaps we can work something out. And so the protective barriers come down at the exact same time that the uh, economy goes into stagnation. And of course, what are you going to do? You have a flood of imports that basically outperform the current domestic market that has been protected for decades upon decades. And Japanese whiskeys 
basically kind of go into free fall consumption within Japan. Next slide. And, you know, the lovely, if uh, at all true 10,000 hour rules, basically over the course of the next couple of decades, we come into some uh, 30,000 hours of focus on quality. And what happens is, is a lot of these smaller producers stop making whiskey at all. Mars, the maker of EY and the Sanuki, they basically mothballed their, their, um, their distillery for a decade. They had made enough spirit that was just sitting there with so little demand. There were probably about 15 or so distilleries that were smaller that closed. Those that it could afford to, like Suntory, like Nika, like Kirin, they decided to focus on quality. They knew that they couldn't ever be the most affordable per price, but they, they definitely thought that they could be the best of what it is that they did. And so we start to see recognition with the World Whiskey Awards, with Jim, Jim Murray's Whiskey Bible. All of them in the early 2000s start to get recognized for the quality of what it is that they made. Next slide. And within that mix, we have the birth of Ichiro's malt. And Ichiro comes on the scene in 2008. Um, and, and what had happened is in 2000, um, the, dis the whiskey distillery that his grandfather had built and made had gone bankrupt. And left to him were the probably about two and a half decades worth of casks that his grandfather distilled. And when they sold off the, the distillery, what they were left with was a bunch of inventory. But in order to keep the inventory in Japan, you need to have a license. Now that license, he had asked, he knocked on the door of Nika, he asked on the door of Suntory, he, act, at, he knocked on the door of um, Kirin, and all of them rejected him for storage. He had found a small distillery, um, Sasanokawa, up in Fu Fukushima, and had asked them, can I keep my grandfather's whiskey here? I, I don't have any place to keep it. And the gentleman agreed to, to keep his grandfather's whiskey. And over the course of the following three years, he visited some 2,000 bars across Japan to hand sell his grandfather's single malt that he had saved after his distillery was sold. Now, in the first year, he was sitting at one of those bars and he had met a designer. And the designer had, had asked him, they had talked, he's like, I, I don't know how to, to sell my grandfather's whiskey. And you know, he's like, well, you have to appeal to collectors. Why don't you make a series of something? And the series, right? Um, he said, why don't you make uh, a, a series of playing cards, 52 with a joker or something like that, that speaks to the age, speaks to the finishing of, of the casks that you're using in the whiskey. And so those became wildly popular within Japan and became wildly popular around the world. So much so that last year at the Hong Kong wine auction, a set of 53, including the Joker, sold for $1.5 million, just 53 bottles of that whiskey. Now with that um, confidence from all the acceptance of his grandfather's whiskey, he decided to build his own distillery in 2008. And it's really been the leader in, in building uh, the new movement of Japanese whiskey across the board. And, and really the focus has been on quality. Uh, an exacting measure of quality. And what we have in front of you are two of his blends. Unfortunately, uh, we get so little of his single malts and they're so highly allocated uh, that I can't share them with you, but certainly uh, within each of his blends are a bit of his single malts. And so what he's done with these blends is when he goes around the world collecting barrels, uh, to, to age his whiskey in, he's also collecting whiskeys to blend with. And so with the Ichiro's malt and grain, he's 
taken and and the limited edition he's got his key malt or the malt in which all the whiskey is blended around then he has single malts from scotland he has irish whiskey he has canadian rye and he has bourbon so he calls it a world whiskey and he then takes those whiskeys and brings them back to his own distillery where they will age in his own barrels for another one to three years. So they're three to five years of age for this, um, for the malt and grain regular, and then another one to three years of age in his own rick houses at his own distillery, breathing the local air, then blended into this final one that you have in front of you. So a true world whiskey. The difference with the second one, the limited edition, is just a, a longer aged whiskey, anywhere from 10 to 40 years of age and country of origin, then another one to three uh, years um, back in his own uh, uh, warehouses. So I'd love for you to taste the malt and grain first. And certainly you get to see some of the spiciness, of the rye, the sweetness of the bourbon, the depth of, of both his and the Scotch single malts, all at play within the mix. And uh, even more so, what is Chichubu versus Ichiro? It's an excellent question. Chichubu um, is the name of the distillery. Ichiro is the name of the brand and also the name of uh, the gentleman making the whiskey. You betcha. So please pour and savor this one. Um, definitely a, a, a lovely whiskey. And if you'll notice these, other than the Sanuki, which was probably the highest of the proof tonight, Ichiro tends to go at a higher proof within the mix. He, three years ago, added a second distillery that has four times the capacity of his current distillery. And we look forward to having more inventory of his product in the next couple of years. So let's see. Um, some people, uh, uh, so does it you know, change blends every year? Great question. There's a little bottle, a little number on the back label of the bottle. And um, although he aims for consistency of flavor each time, you can see what batch um, your, your whiskey is. And it's kind of fun to compare what batch 17 is versus batch 20. Um, I believe we're batch number 23 that actually gets imported into the United States at the moment and is really, uh, there, there's definitely a thread throughout it all, but there's nuanced changes that come along the way. And, and with most whiskeys, if, um, if you notice year in and year out, there are subtle changes. Malt is only barley, grains only use other grain. That's correct. Hey, Eric, there's right, a, a couple of questions about yeah. the, if you could repeat just a little bit about what the um, different barrels were or what the different sources of whiskey were that went into this blend. Absolutely. So um, within the mix here, within both of these, a key malt um, in terms of, of whiskey making is the malt in which you blend around. So, and so the key malt within both of these are his own whiskeys, his own single malts. So at the heart of this blend is Ichiro's malt. Now, he then goes to Scotland and there's probably about five to eight different single malts that he has collected from Scotland that are in this blend. There's Irish whiskey, there's Canadian rye, and there is American bourbon that are also in this whiskey as well. These in the regular, the not limited, uh, we have the whiskeys are three to five years in country of origin, and then aged another one to three years back in his barrels within Japan. Now, the barrel mix across Japan most of the barrels are ex-bourbon because they're the most readily available and the most widely used across the entire um, whiskey world. There are some sherry casks. There are some port finishes. There are Japanese oak 
called Mizunara in the mix. There is um, virgin American oak. There is French um, uh, European virgin oak as well. But the dominant um, in almost any of these, unless specified, is going to be that of X bourbon. Does that make sense for everybody? With the limited edition, what we have is a whiskey that is over 10 years of age and uh, have whiskeys as old as 20 and 40 years of age within it. The same thing in the country of origin, we have whiskeys that are 10 to 40 years of age, then shipped back to Ichiro's at, at Chichibu and aged uh, for another one to three years and blended into what you have today. Please feel free to taste them both. I think you'll see the depth um, and, and complexity and how much more savory the limited is. Just uh, my understanding, uh, you know, I, it's easy to see the difference within the mix, I think. Um, I think they're both really lovely whiskeys and it's a great way for Ichiro to share his, his taste with the world. Um, even though he has such a small amount uh, of single malts out there, just to let you know how we probably only get 3000 bottles of his single malt, single malt into the United States a year on a good year. Had to add water. Yeah, absolutely. It'll open up a little bit with a little bit of water, especially at this proof. Certainly. That's a good call. Well, what I'd ask of you now is, um, Ichiro, so Ichiro is a common name, means firstborn son, and certainly a highly valuable commodity uh, within Japan. So not uncommon for folks to be named Ichiro within Japan. So uh, the, the ball player is, is, is a, certainly the most famous uh, of that namesake. And they do make lovely highballs. So however, however, way, however you'd like to approach it. Next slide. Is there another slide? I believe. No? Okay. No, so, yeah. yeah. So I'd like to just conclude with what's happening today. Um, so within the last decade, uh, what we've seen, and really in the last five years, we, we now have 40 whiskey licenses in Japan. When my wife and I started uh, this company in 2012, there were, I think, seven or eight whiskey licenses that were actively producing in Japan. And because of the popularity, we've certainly seen a boom in smaller distilleries. Much of that thanks to Ichiro. The other thing that has happened in the mix is the Japanese um, have have had no specific laws governing whiskey. And so what defines a Japanese whiskey? And really what defines a Japanese whiskey, even to this day, is that it's bottled in Japan. The liquid itself could be from other countries. And the liquid honestly just has to be a certain color according to the Japanese government. Now, all of these producers that we work with alongside of Nika, Suntory, and Kirin have actively put together new rules and are currently lobbying the government to establish what is a Japanese whiskey. And so by definition, in, and hopefully coming soon, I have some friends in the, in, in the Japanese government that they'll start adopting these officially and being recognized. But the, the, the whiskey actually has to be distilled in Japan. Um, we have a lot of producers that are out there that haven't been wake, making whiskey long enough. Um, and yet they still have whiskey in a bottle that they're exporting as Japanese whiskey. So if you see a product on the shelf and 
you ask, does this actually have a distillery in Japan? Just be weary. There are several brands that are out there that um, really can't speak to any um, origin or provenance within the, within the category. Um, I am excited to see all of these new producers coming onto the scene and um, really creating this new whiskey trail that's within Japan. So I'd love to open up some questions. I'd love to hear what people liked, what they didn't like. Can I ask a question? Certainly. So <clears throat> this, I normally think about scotch as scotch whiskey, pretty well mm -hmm. defined, I think. Certainly. Yeah. Um, but what you're calling, what they're calling, whiskey is here. And I'm used to talking about something that is rye, bourbon. Those are pretty well defined, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But what we're calling here whiskey is not so well defined. Is that correct? It is, it is quite gray at the moment. What, what has happened is that these core producers have gotten together and set regulations on um, what whiskey is to be defined as within Japan. There have been too many people uh, within the market that have taken advantage of this very gray zone of how one is to define whiskey. And so... So let me be specific about a couple of the ones that I found because I tasted along. Yeah. Just as a curiosity. Mm -hmm. First of all, the one that is the blended Iwai, mm -hmm. which in the commercial world, is that green or blue, or which one is the one that we got here? The green. This was the green one, is that right? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. if, you went to, if you went to buy it somewhere. Mm -hmm. Now, it struck me that it tasted more like bourbon than scotch. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. That's an absolute correct assessment. Is it more bourbon, in fact, in its mix? <laughs> um, it, is more, it is more corn grain than it is malt, 100%. It, it is definitely more. So it really is yeah. more. Okay. And after that, the, uh, the Ichiro limited edition also mm -hmm. tasted very sweet like bourbon. Or am I wrong? And, uh, I think that that has more to do that most of Ichiro's uh, molten grain, um, I would say that he has a, uh, there's, I don't, he never shares the exact blend. But I know that there's a good deal of malt, a minimum of 30% of, of, of that blend is malt. But there certainly could be a good deal of um, uh, sweeter Canadian and, and American bourbon within that mix. But now, since we're saying all that, mm -hmm. I did take a look on the web before this to see what mm -hmm. the prices are for some of these. And they're wildly yeah. variable. Yes, 100%. For example... The, uh, the one that I was talking about, the EY one, is very inexpensive. and I, Maybe it's a different one, but it was $40 or something like that. No, no, no. EY45, EY Akashi, all of these, those are, are meant to be accessible entry points into the world of Japanese whiskey. And then the, but the high-end ones here, the, the, the PD one and the last one, they're $100 $150. They're, yep. And... Um, are they imported? I, I've never noticed in the stores, so now I'll take a look, but are, uh, are they imported? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's my company. I import all of these. All of so, them. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Don't mean to dominate. I'll get, get a host title. Hey, uh, it's an open floor. Anyone's welcome to join in. So, Fred, could you just those share the approximate retail prices on the six that we take? Yeah. I certainly can. So um, Akashi, uh, the first one that we started with, the uh, should be, I believe, around um, $40. And then moving into the uh, EY45 should be anywhere from $30 to $40. Then the Akashi single malt should be probably 60 to $80. Um, and the Sanuki should be 150 to $200. Uh, 
the Ichiro's Mountain Grain should be 90 to 120, and the limited edition should be over 200. So um, as far as in your area, just pulling up um, where it is that we sell, uh, any, um, most of the total wines across the country car carry our stuff. There is Caskers, which is an online uh, service. You should be able to order any of these products online via Caskers. And then so let's see where else. Um, Cambridge Spirits, Marty's Liquors, and then another online service called Drizzly should be able to get uh, most of these products to you. Great pricing there. I love the Ichiro's Molten Grain 100, Sanuki 180. Great. Thank you. So sometime around 2005, I visited the Nika Miyagi Kyo. Yeah, uh, lovely place, right? Yeah, beautiful. And, you know, my kids were little, and all I remember is it was an awful smell for them. <laughs> but after, after the tour, you know, you get the little cups of the one year, three year, mm -hmm. five year. Duration. I was the only Caucasian guy there, and they pulled me through the velvet curtain and gave lovely. me the, uh, whatever it was, like 15, 20 something awesome and my knees my knees bent i never had anything like that before what what are the, what are those what are those whiskeys can you get those here um so in all honesty any japanese whiskey um that has an age statement over 10 years of age you're uh now uh these days are just absurd pricing i mean even coming for me i mean I have an Ichiro's tenure that sells for a couple thousand dollars. Um, so some, you know, uh, most reasonable in the mix is probably uh, a Takitsuru blend. Um, and that's, that's maybe a few hundred dollars. Um, so there, un unfortunately, um, in the last decade or so, the, the pricing is, is really been uh, too expensive. Um, I think as the demand increases, um, as the supply increases, we'll, we'll see a leveling of the playing field. But the last report I read, it says we still have about a decade before we actually achieve inventory to, to kind of demand things. So um, good as an importer, kind of, but it, it still wish that, uh, you know, 20 years ago, I could get a 17-year-old Takatsuru in Japan for, for 40 bucks. You know, it's it beautiful. So these days, I'd be lucky to pay five hundred dollars for it. So, cool. trip to Japan question? distilleries. I'm moving to Japan next month, guys. So please keep my contract contact. I, I'd love to show you all around. It'd be great. Lucy, you have a question? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Hi, Lucy. Hi, thank you very much for a lovely lecture. It was actually really nice to get the cultural aspect of it. So I appreciate it greatly. Thank um, you. So I have a question, two questions actually. Mm -hmm. Who is actually employed by the factory or producer or the company to make the blends, Master Blender? I don't know the actual title. Because Master that's Blender is actually the correct title. and. Oh. And I think um, this you're in your business, right? Pardon? It, it's the most important person based on whose expertise we're drinking what we're drinking. Yeah, I mean, and I think culturally speaking, it's a great uh, observation and something that I, I probably um, should have touched upon earlier. But there's there's somewhat of a divide. Uh, certainly, we in the West um, uh, often put more import to the master distiller. And um, the Japanese, um, certainly uh, anybody here that may speak a little bit of Japanese and have even just observed Japanese um, uh, popular culture, the obsession um, with uh, texture, how things lie on the palate um, it is it's just so, it goes on and on and on. And, and so, 
Um, and, and certainly why Japanese whiskeys tend to be at a lower ABV because they tend to be a little more gentle on the palate, more approachable. Um, their approach tends to be uh, a, a more, more it, it's a very simple explanation, but more round on the palate. We often in the West tend to be a little bit more angular with our whiskeys on the palate. And, and so, um, and the master blender, certainly for the larger companies, are, are heralded as, as the top guys. Um, and, and Scotch. Uh, Japanese. Oh, and that explains it, the roundness and the softness. Yeah, absolutely. And, okay. and so, yeah, and so. Question, just to follow up. So mm -hmm. somebody from the West or America, why would one a consumer uh, choose a Japanese made production over that of Scotland? Uh, yeah, I think it's a matter of taste. I think going back to the, the approach, I think if you notice, uh, many of these do tend to be a little more gentle and a little more approachable yes. than um, a lot of their Western counterparts. And if you make that parallel, because the histories are so close uh, with, with Scotch whiskeys, um, that that they tend to be an easier access point into the world of whiskey that often um, some people find not very approachable. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank Pardon? you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you so much. We had a question from George and Rita. Hey, thanks, Kevin. Thanks so much uh, for organizing this. And Eric, great, uh, great session here. Really enjoyed this. Um, yeah, my pleasure, man. Awesome. Um, two quick questions for you. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first one is, what sort of foods? Uh, Japanese food. What sort of Japanese <laughs> do you uh, recommend to pair with any of these uh, these beverages? Oh man, I you know that is a a great question. I have um I have done uh, pairings with things as surprisingly. Um, simple as, as, as sushi and sashimi, right? And done the highball piece, well, lightly diluted, right? So, mm -hmm. and, um, but I've even had it on the rocks. Obviously, um, Wagyu um, is, is a lovely approach. Uh, yakitori, um, grilled chicken is also something that is an excellent pairing with that. Uh, I think uh, I see, you know, um, uh, uh, ramen on there as well and shabu shabu all of those are lovely things but I think the thing that has surprised me the most is uh, um, that it can actually be um, uh, really nice with sashimi and, and things of, that are more delicate and, and that, that was a little bit surprising the savory side is the obvious piece right but the fact that I've had some that that have um, that has worked well, and certainly had a really great. Um, uh, this was over in Japan, and I just had an excellent experience. So it was kind of punctuated uh, sake, punctuated with a couple of whiskeys along the way uh, oh. of the course. So that was great. But uh, I mean, like any pairing, uh, my original background is sake. Um, so, uh, any pairing, um, I think is just a fun exploration to see what works, but certainly some of those that were listed were great. Thank you. That sounds fun to me too. Sort of the experimental approach. I like it. Yeah. Um, yeah. actually that, uh, also leads into my next question, which is, mm -hmm. um, what other spirits, uh, do you import if any, besides Japanese whiskeys? Oh, so, <laughs> um, so we, uh, so within the Americas, we um, import uh, Sotol, we import uh, Mezcal um, and Tequila. Um, we also um, uh, have uh, rum and different bitters from Haiti. Um, we have uh, um, over in Europe, we have uh, a gin from Galicia. Um, we have the uh, only single malt producer out of Italy called Puni. We have lovely young guys uh, out of Northern Ireland, uh, whiskey called Two Stacks. Um, out of uh, India, we have uh, 
a gin called Gin Gigi and a single malt called Kemet. And um, then we have shochu, we have some sakes, and we have some gin out of Japan as well. So uh, a pretty eclectic mix within it. It's a lot of fun to travel to all these places. I imagine. Thanks so much. Appreciate it, Eric. You, yeah, I saw you. Japanese vermouth as well. Yeah, so we made, uh, we have the first sake vermouth. So being fortified with rice shochu and uh, using local botanicals for bittering. And because sake doesn't have the acidity that wine does, uh, using a local citrus called kabosu uh, to acidify it. So it's, it's lovely in lieu of a dry vermouth. Um, we have a sweet vermouth that is uh, using uh, umeshu. Those that aren't familiar with umeshu, it is a, uh, a plum, plum spirit. Um, and then uh, it's also sweetened with an Okinawan black sugar. So that'll come out next year, early next year. Excited about that. You guys are a wholesaler, I take it, from your website, not a uh, We're an importer. So within the United States, we, we have a three-tiered system. Um, you're an importer or producer, then wholesaler, and uh, then, then the retail market. With... Um, you can be an importer and a wholesaler. Uh, we currently are not. Um, one of my partners does have a wholesaler in the state of Illinois, um, but we're not vertically integrated to that point at the moment. You didn't say anything about your picture of Bill Murray. Any thoughts about that? Oh, just lost in translation. So those that are familiar with the, the, the film, um, He's there to uh, promote Suntory whiskey, I believe. And so uh, I, I just, uh, you know, two decades old at this point, but those that were, you know, have recollection to, the, to that cultural moment, I just thought that is a, a nice little a, a point of humor within the mix. So, um, but yeah, so just a reference to Lost in Translation and, and why we was there. And, and I think when I started this journey with Japanese whiskey, the the first before people were familiar with Japanese whiskey, there was oh Japanese whiskey Bill Murray that would be the 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 reply that I got so and and yeah it came out twenty years ago right I know that's when I um so crazy feels like yesterday but uh, it definitely that that was the, the the reference point it's a lot of fun still a great film um, and there, definitely. Um, uh, a good cultural point of view uh, for, for that time. So it was great, a lot of fun. I gotta go back and, and rewatch it. So it should be fun. Great guys, any other questions in the mix? Okay, well, you know, I'll stick around and break out with any of you if you have anything else. Um, but uh, you know, uh, I, I really uh, appreciate everyone's time. Uh, did we, oh, I have a question for you all. Did we come to a, a, a point of where Hinoki is from? And is, is it indigenous indeed to Japan? Or is it, uh, had it made its way over there um, sometime prior? That, did anyone find that out? No, okay. What, no, Wikipedia says it's indigenous to Japan, Cyprus. Okay. Well, there you go. Well, Wikipedia, always a great academic source, right? So, um, Actually, but um, we could dig a little deeper. What, what, what about that? Sugi? Sugi is also cedar? Yeah, Sugi is also cedar, absolutely. Is, is it a different, uh, different type of cedar or? Yeah, I mean, Sugi, Hinoki, they, I mean, you go across Japan, I'm not sure really what, the, but I know that they are ubiquitous across the islands for sure. So absolutely. And I, I'd always heard them referred to as indigenous um, uh, to the area, but um, you know, I was just curious if there was any, any, any corrections to the mix. Awesome. All right. I Can worked, I just, uh, I wanna, yeah, I want to add something to about the Sunuki. 
Um, you should all be very privileged. I am a new employee. I've yet to have that. We don't have it in DC yet. So all of you have tried this whiskey before I have. So I'm a little jealous over here, but waiting to get mine next week. Jen, Jen didn't even get a set. She's just sitting there listening patiently. Sorry about that. I've had enough. <laughs> it Thanks, was great. Jen. All right. Well, thank you for Oh, sorry. Is there a question? Yeah, sorry. I actually had one question. Um, so it seems that Japanese whiskeys are generally aged um, less than 10 years, but mm -hmm. it's pretty common for scotches to be aged longer than 10 years. Yeah. Can you talk about the differences of, you know, why that is? Oh, absolutely. It's the same reason that we have, um, you know, a minimum aging on, on bourbon to be called, uh, referred to as straight bourbon of four years, right? It's just the climactic difference. So the fluctuation um, of, of, of temperature and certainly having uh, warmer temperatures uh, causes a, a, a quicker aging. And so the fluctuation in temperature um, across Japan and certainly having warmer weather uh, causes uh, your whiskey to, to mature much quicker. And, and so um, it's just a matter of climate. The same reason that, that Takitsuru wanted to have his distillery up in the north of Japan because it was more similar to the climate of that of Scotland. And so most of, of the whiskey um, within Japan is, is aged in a climate um, that has temperatures um, as high as the 90s with humidity that can be, um, you know, in 90% and and below freezing, but not not all the time. I mean, certainly in in Nagano and within the in in Yamanashi and Fuji, we do get longer um, cold periods. But uh, a, a great fluctuation in temperature certainly causes a more rapid maturation. Thank you. A lot of us had to take yeah. kinetics courses at MIT. Uh, I think they should have used whiskey maturation as their taste. Nah, I think it made, made a much more fun uh, a class, that's for sure. I see a question from Petros. Yeah, I guess um, I was listening to a blog, uh, not a blog, a podcast. Sorry, I've, I've drank too much. Um, that's all right. It's about um, uh, people who are trying to uh, speed up the aging process, either by varying the temperature more quickly mm -hmm. or things like that, using basically new technology. Are mm. Japanese companies trying any of that? And, and what do you think about these techniques? Um, so Japanese are, as far as I know, are not um, trying much of that. And it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, the perception of Japanese technology and certainly um, the great adopters of existing technology and improving upon it. But it, they, if something's not broke, that sell them to the very much purists in, in, in terms of technique and, and, and approaching these things. Um, I so happened to have had uh, a quickly aged whiskey yesterday. Um, and so, and the depth of flavor um, was compelling, uh, but the balance and the faults were also uh, a little bit out of skew. So from, this is something that um, you know, I gave uh, a white whiskey and, and got it back and drank like a, a somewhat bad aged whiskey. So I think over time, the, the technology will get there. And I, I you know, I, I'm fascinated to see what comes of it. I, if it tastes good, I've got no, no problem with it, as long as you're transparent about how, how it's made, you know? Uh, so anything that could bring a, a good beverage to market, as uh, I'm, I'm very curious about, but from what I've paid far, I, I wasn't, wasn't too thrilled with. So, but just one experience, but uh, curious. That's a great question. Thanks. Thank you. All right. All right. I think we've reached that point where it's time to break out. Um, mm -hmm. Before we go, Eric, thank you so much. Uh, again, not just for the presentation tonight and everything you do to bring Japanese whiskey to us here in the States, but also for going through all the work to get these kits put together. I know it was a labor of love. 
Um, so appreciate everything. Well, thank Eli and his team for that. Um, they, they did that out, out West in LA. I, I just was hanging out. So I definitely I'll pass the, uh, the appreciation on to Eli. So thank you. Absolutely. Uh, and for everybody who'd like to stay around and I encourage you to do so, we're now going to break out into groups just randomly about five to six people per group to chat with, uh, fellow alumni about the whiskey that we're drinking, you know, any of your experiences uh, at MIT or since. And then we'll come back together around nine o'clock Eastern to get back together with Eric if there's any lingering questions or things that came up in our breakouts. I uh, hope you can stick around and I'll see some of you very soon.